Christopher for the kind introduction. Uh, Assalamu alaikum everybody. I'm Dr. Kiran Hilal. Before I start this topic, um, I would like personally would like to thank the Vakans Academy of Neurological Surgery, uh, namely Dr. Athir Naam and his team, Mustafa and Sharif Jirania. Thank you so much for helping me out. And Ummehania, who were, who were, she was the one who was announcing this lecture throughout on the social media. Thank you so much, everybody, for this. So, and the topic that I'm going to discuss is the spinal dystrophism. I hope you can hear me clearly, right? Yes, we can hear you very clearly. Okay. Okay. So uh, it's going to be, I'm going to talk about the simple diagnostic approach and I hope that I'm going to make it as simple as much possible. So before I start, I have no financial disclosure for the material of this presentation. Uh, the sum of the material I've taken from the open resources, including the internet and the published article with fair use of disclaimer. And my talk is inspired by the talk of Dr. Professor Andre Rosie, who is my favorite pediatric neurologist, neurologist who works in the University of Geneva. And also by the talk of the Professor Viri Cho, who, who she works in the Prince Wales Hospital, Hong Kong. So when I was, at, so this was a surprise slide with Dr. Athar was quite keen about. So then I was a medical student and I was a radiology resident. Whenever the word spinal dystrophism was there and the spinal dystrophism for me looks like this. Like all the nest dolls, all the nest dolls look similar, but they all are different in sizes and shape and mice and stories. Every story behind them is different. So that, that and I was really, it was struggling during my student life to, to differentiate the different types of spinal dystrophism. And it is actually very important to differentiate the each type because each type has different clinical and logical imaging feature, has a different uh, clinical outcome and has a different clinical and surgical management. So this was for me, uh, spinal dystrophism when I was a student. So what is in the talk? I'm going to talk about the terminology first, then we are going to talk about a little bit embryology, then we are going to discuss like, why do we really need imaging for every case, then we are going to discuss the clinical and radiological classification, and I try to make it as easy as possible. There are going to be a case-based imaging approach for a few cases, and at the end, if time will allow us, we are going to have a small quiz after, at the end of this talk. So let's start with the terminology. Initially, spina bifida was a term which was used, which is the defective fusion of posterior spinal element. This term is currently replaced by the new term, which is the spinal dystrophism. And it's a Greek word. This means bad, that means suture. So bad suturing for the back is a spinal dystrophism. Previously, old term was spina bifida aperta or cystica. And this term has been replaced with the new term, which is the open spinal dystrophism. The old term for the spina bifida occulta has been replaced with the new term, which is the closed spinal dystrophism. So before, uh, before uh, I start uh, discussing my cases and discussing the imaging, I really want all of you to have some time for this embryology to understand this embryology. To understand, having the understanding of embryology of spine is very important for a neurosurgeon and for a neuroradiologist and a radiologist to understand the, spine, the different types of spinal dystrophism. You see, wise Admin in ek dafa kaha tha, a wise man once said, how beautiful you are going to be in your life or how strong and white kind of person you are going to be in your life. It's not depending the money or wealth or education that you have. It's all depend how your um, embryological cascade worked in your initial life. Agar wahan pe koi, if there's any disorganization occurred, aapke blocks are not settled in proper alignment, then you are end up with a big disaster. So embryology is a crucial part being a doctor and being a surgeon and so radiologist to know. So when we talk about the embryology of spine, we have the three main steps, the gastrulation, the primary neurulation and secondary neurulation. So please don't get scared. I won't go into the detail and I'll try to make it as simple as possible. So when we talk about the gastrulation and the primary neurulation, so just, just before I start the video, I want you to remember that the primary neurulation is the part of, there are the two processes which are very important, the primary neurulation and the secondary neurulation. The primary neurulation makes the primary uh, neural tube and the secondary, uh, uh, that tube which is responsible in the future making your uh, brain, which is rhombencephalon, telencephalon, diencephalon, and the whole spine till the uh, conus matularis. 
beyond the corners medullary you know, down to the corners medullary is the sacrum and the coccyx all are made by the secondary lobation so what is gastrulation as the whole story starts with the uh, bilaminar disc so this is the bilaminar embryological disc the blue part is the ectoderm and the pink part is the endoderm at the fifth week of gestation there is a small pit the primitive streak or primitive duct of uh, the group is formed in the ectoderm and through this primitive duct the cells of ectoderm starts going backward dorsally so this pit is formed and see what's happening here so at this point you can see the two germinal layer a two layer disc of uh, embryo is now have become the three layers now there we can appreciate the green color here as well so the blue layer which was initially was the ectoderm is now your uh, new ectoderm or uh, 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 epiblast the team uh, the, the initially that was the epiblast is now your ectoderm the green as the cell of the uh, the epiblast move downward do, dorsally towards the endoblast it is now giving the another green color and this color is the mesoderm and now the previously your endoblast is known as the endoderm so now the bilaminar disc has become the trilaminar disc so conversion of bilaminar disc into the trilaminar disc is known as the gastrulation process so as the mesoderm is formed from the epiblast cell you can see there is a brown duct here the hole and this is your notochord so what's happening as the mesoderm is formed this notochord start giving the signals to the again ectodermal cells now it's giving the signals to the ectoderm and now the ectoderm is start making a deep pit a groove is forming and this groove is having the two neural fold the sleeves so you can see for the signals are going from the mesoderm from the neck to the uh, notochord and now this group is going more deeper and deeper and deeper and the fold of this fold tube this group is now folding and now trying to fuse in the middle as they fuse they make the primary neural tube so now if you can see we have the three layers endoderm the ectoderm and the mesoderm in the mesoderm we have the you can see these two dots these are the mesodermal somites which will in the future form the your vertebral column your um, lateral bodies and the posterior elements now the ectoderm within the um, uh, mesoderm has formed a primary neural tube now this primary neural tube starts separating from the ectoderm so now we have the two types of ectoderm the neuroectoderm which is the neural tube and the ectoderm which is a cutaneous um, uh in cutaneous uh, ectoderm so that's how it is now what's happening after this process now they are in a zip like process uh, in a zip like uh, fashion this after the formation of this neural tube it is start bending and start fusing and how it is start fusing first there are the two layers which start in a zip pattern like uh, start to closing first is the mesoderm close this uh, tube and then then the neurocutaneous the skin try to close it in a zip like manner so first your um, um cranial part gets fused and then your um, a quadral part gets fused so this was about the gastrulation and now this primary neural tube uh, will give you the brain and the spinal cord till the level of the conus medullaris so how the spine form below the level of the conus so this is this blue structure that you are seeing is we have seen so far ki hamara primary neural tube hai. now at the quadral end of this primary neural tube small few cells get uh, aggregated and form the mass of a uh, cells now this mass of the cells start cavitating and making a tube and this is called the secondary neurulation and this secondary tube is start fusing with your primary tube so the primary neural tube fuses with the secondary neural tube and the secondary this is called the secondary neurulation and the who after the fusion of this both you have your future brain the spinal cord and the cord beyond the uh, conus medullaris so far if you have any question i'm ready to take any question so if uh, this is clear then it's fine no um perfect perfect okay okay, uh, okay kiran sorry i will interrupt you uh, so in the chat box you can see there's a, a feedback form link is shared so it is mandatory for the participants to fill this form and uh, it will be also important to receive certificate uh, for the regular participants who fill the feedback form uh, we will distribute a certificate uh, by the end of this year so it's important to fill the feedback form 
Thank you. I thought you were saying something about this uh, talk. Achha. Sorry, Dr. Karan. No, it's absolutely fine. So now we have done with our immunology. We're coming to the next part of our talk is the clinical radiological classification of spinal dystrophism. What I want, especially the trainee, neurosurgery trainee, and the resident trainee, remember that this classification is not a separate clinical classification. Or it's not a separate radiological classification. It has to be a hybrid classification. It's a clinical radiological classification of the spinal dystrophism. So as we have already know the new term, the open defect and the closed defect. So when we are talking about the open defect, then we see either with this open defect, do we have the elevated mass? If we have the elevated mass, then we have the myelomeningo seal. If we don't have the uh, with open defect uh, elevated mass, then it's a myelo seal. If you have a closed defect and you have a subcutaneous mass or it is a fat containing, then either you're dealing with a lipomyelo uh, seal or your lipomyelomeningo seal. Or if you have a closed defect with subcutaneous mass and it is not fat containing, you are dealing with the, uh, just give me a minute. So you're dealing with, um, let me, okay, dealing with the terminal myelocystic seal or meningo seal. Or if you, um, if you have a closed defect and you have no subcutaneous mass, then either you are dealing with some low lying cord or complex um, entities such as dastromatomyelia. I know many of you are thinking it's too much to grab, too much to remember. I don't want you to remember. I just want you to have a journey through my presentation and still try to remember as much as possible. So same chart, before we are discussing in the detail, the important questions come in your clinic when the patient comes to your clinic. Do we really need imaging in every case or we do not need imaging? To answer this question, what's the literature say? It says, the simple dimple, if you have a simple dimple on your clinical examination, that means if you have a dimple which is less than 5 millimeter in diameter or it is less than 2.5 centimeter from the inner wall, you really don't need to perform any imaging because these patients are hardly going to have any neurological symptoms in their life. But if the dimple, the skin dimple, the stigmata is uh, complex or atypical, that means if it is having a more than 5 millimeter in size, uh, or if it is, if it is to more than 2.5 centimeter from the anal ward. And if the child age is less than six months, when as a radiologist, we are able to perform the ultrasound spine, then you go for the ultrasound spine. And if you can't, you don't have the expert, you can go for the MRI to for the see it because you are dealing with some complex dystrophism. But if the child is having the atypical dimple and the child age is more than six months of age, then Mm -hmm. MRI is the modality of choice. But many could then the question comes, do we really need the CT as well? My answer as a pediatric radiologist is definitely not. CT is not going to help anything in your information because it does not have as good as a soft tissue resolution in comparison with MRI. Um, it is going to give you unnecessary addition to these babies and it's really not going to be helpful. But yes, there are the few cases when they, when these dystrophisms are associated with complex bony malformations that in some few selected cases, you may need help of the city or in those cases when, um, where you really can't sedate these babies, sedation is a bigger major issue, then yes, you can consider it. But overall, city is not the ideal modality of choice to um, investigate these spinal dystrophism. This is uh, this is actually very nice. This is right, which happened. The guy simple dimple. Keep it simple, huh? Like yeah. lessons. <laughs> yeah. Lessons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All those who are attending, it just just try to memorize this. What Doctor uh, Kiran has put there. Five millimeters are come here, or two millimeter less than two point five centimeter from inner verge. Keep it simple. Okay, great. Thank you. See you again. Okay. Okay, so now coming to the systemic approach, when it's come to the systemic approach, what should be the systemic approach? So when I'm talking about the systemic approach, it's just this systemic approach has not only for the radiology, the systemic approach is clinical as well. So how can we achieve that? So the, I try to make this as simple as possible. So if you remember your these six questions for the systemic or clinical or radiological approach, you can nail it. So what are these six questions? The question is either first, either the skin is open or closed, you have a skin intact or not. The second question is again, the, is there any, uh, uh, there any elevated mass or not? Uh, that's mean, uh, is there any expansion of the subacoid space or not? Question number three is, the sub, is there any, if it is the closed one especially, do you have a subcutaneous mass? Or if yes, that it is a fat containing or CSF containing. 
Or the question four is either do you have any intraspinal fatty lesion? Fifth is the intraspinal, do you have any intraspinal cystic lesion? And if you have the lipoma or intraspinal cystic lesion, what is the relation of this lesion from the cord? And at the end, last but not least, very important question, do you have the subcutaneous tract or not? Again, uh, too many questions to remember in the morning with, while you're frosting. I know it's difficult to remember, but don't worry. We are going to uh, recall the, the, these. My whole talk is uh, going to be around the, the systemic approach and that, uh, that classification which I showed you. So hopefully you will grab something at the end of this talk. So just forget about the rest of the question. Just focus on two questions. But, you know, question number one, either it is a closed defect or open defect with an intact scan or not. And second is either do you have an elevated mass or not, if it is the open one. That's mean the expansion of the cervix, not me. So let's see what does it mean. So question number one, if I say it is the open defect clinically, or it has to be clear clinically, then that's, that's, this is what I mean, that you have a skin problem like this, you, you, you can see that the neural precord is exposed to the external noise. And when I say it's a closed defect, then that's mean either you are dealing with a large subcutaneous mass, this is the elevated large subcutaneous mass, or if you don't have, in cases of closed de uh, defect, when the skin is totally covering the strapism, if you don't have this mass, then probably you will have some kind of st skin stigma, which can be a tuft of hair, uh, the pit on the skin, or some kind of um, birthmark at the back. So you really need to remember. So the, the hint is there, you just need to go and dig it. So coming back to the question number two, uh, is there any elevated mass or not? So when I say it is an open defect and you have an elevated mass like this, as the picture I've shown, that's mean you are dealing with the myelomeningocele and this elevation is not only for the neural precord which is exposed, it's the expansion of the subarachnoid, uh, the arachnoid space and the CSF containing space as well. And when I say the defect is open, but there's no elevated mass, that this is how it should be. That's mean there is no CSF or uh, subacnoid space elevation. So you're dealing with a mito C. So coming back to our question number one, and let's see how can we answer with different examples. So this was the case of a child in which the fetal MRI was performed. Uh, in this particular case, the fetal M the indication of performing the fetal MRI was because on antenatal anomaly scan, um, the, real, uh, the, the sonologist reported as a spinal dystrophism. It was further investigated with the fetal MRI and on the fetal MRI, we found this. So this is the sagittal image of the fetal MRI. The whole fetus is seen here. And you can see the CSF spaces and the bladder spaces and everything looks fine, uh, white. So that's mean you're high pentons, that's mean you're dealing with the T2-weighted images. And so far in the scores, I hope and I believe that you know what's the, how to differentiate between the different sequences. So we have this. So first question again come from our systemic uh, approach. Is the skin is intact or not? So definitely you can see this is the skin and you see there's a defect. So your answer comes, no, this is not intact skin. So that's mean you are dealing with the open defect. Now you have given the answer. The second question from our uh, systemic approach come, is there, if it is open defect, we know that the same child, yehi bacha, or they, sorry, not bacha, the fetus in the axial plane. Is there any elevated mass or not? So you can see this is the vertebra. These are the P is uh, the posterior element. And you can see the defect here. And you can see the, there's a communication. Yes, we have the open defect, but is there any elevated mass? Answer is no, we are not having any um, elevated mass. So this is the diagram this is showing. So this is the defect, you, the, the, here you can see the neural placard, the neural tissue is coming out of it, but this blue thing, again, I can make it more easy. Let me take the pen. Okay, so this blue thing, I hope you can see what I'm drawing is a CSF space. So there is no expansion or herniation of the CSF space. So open defect, um, without any elevated mass, the answer is minus C. So this is another case. In this baby, again, this fetus, similar indication of uh, performing the fetal MRI because uh, antenatal scan showed the abnormality in the spine. Fetal MRI was done. Again, the question number one come in this question. Yeah, is their skin is intact or not? So they can, the skin is not intact. You can see this area, focus on this area. The skin is not intact. And even on ultrasound, oh, th this is, of course, the postnatal ultrasound of this baby, you can see there was a defect. So this is the whole skin you can see. And here it is the defect. So through this defect, now we know the skin is not intact. So what is, uh, so we know we are dealing with the open defect. But again, the question number two comes in our scheme. 
is there elevated mass or not? So same child in the axial plane, there's a defect, open defect, we have established it, but there is elevated mass or not. So you can see there's a large elevated mass is coming out of it. And the diagram this is like this. So you have not only the placard, which is a neural tissue, which is coming out of this defect, but the, the, there's expansion of this blue space. This is a subacroid space. So yes, there is a defect. Yes, there's the elevated mass. So elevated mass in an open defect, you are dealing with the myelomeningo C. So I have so far show you the two cases, both were having the open defect, both are having the open defect, but in one case you have the elevated mass, which is the myelomeningo seal and the, another open defect, which is have, which is the defect without the uh, elevated mass. So you're dealing with the myelo seal. So now you know your two entities of the open defect. So please do not forget what all I want you uh, and my radiology resident who have joined us today and the neurology res neurosurgical resident that always remember, whenever you are dealing with the open defect, it is always, always associated with a carry type two myclination. So when you are reviewing their images, always focus at the cranial cervical junction because you see here, you will at the cranial cervical junction here, you will have some kind of herniation because there's a continuous leakage of the CSF from this open defect. So you will have some degree of brain herniation. So it is very, very important to, um, whenever you have this open defect, look at the cranial cervical junction to see the brain herniation. So the, this is the important point, which I want you to remember in this, in these two cases. So when we talk about the malingomyelocele, I think um, it is unfair if we do not discuss this randomized control, uh, sorry, randomized trial, which was done for the correction, prenatal correction for the myelomeningo seal. And uh, as we know, it was the big milestone which was achieved in the history of neurosurgery. But uh, this CHOP trial, and but unfortunately, this CHOP trial has was not able to uh, complete its target. Uh, the initial target was 200, but they completed this trial, uh, they stopped this trial because of the efficacy of and some um, uh, pre-surgical and during post-surgical uh, maternal uh, complications. They stopped it at 183 patients. But this great trial showed clearly that the prenatal intrauterine correction of myelomeningo seal um, uh, which uh, uh, when it was uh, the repair was done, those babies, their neurological outcome was clearly better than those who had the repair in their postnatal life, and the, the need for their shunt in their in, in their subsequent uh, subsequent in life uh, after the one year age was uh, of course it was, they did not record any shunting as compared uh, for the postnatal repairs. So in short, definitely uh, that the result of this trial showed that if their children, the, these fetuses, these poor babies have their correction in uh, early in their life, in antenatal intrauterine life. So definitely they can have better uh, survival in terms of uh, neurological, uh, neurological outcomes. So um, coming back to our clinical radiology classification, again, I said it's going to, my talk is going to be around this chart. So now we have discussed the open defect with elevated mass and without elevated mass. Now we know the myelomeningo seal and the myelo seal. So forget about this. Now moving towards the closed defect. Now we have the two types. In the closed defect, either uh, do we have the subcutaneous mass or no subcutaneous mass? So we'll just focus till this point. Now, going back again to the systemic approach, we have answered, we know how to answer these two questions. One number one, the number two, we know how to answer that. Now coming to the question number three, is there, especially those cases when this is the closed defect, the question for number three comes, is there a subcutaneous mass? And if there's a mass, it is a fat containing mass or CSF containing mass. And let's see how we answer it. So this is the case. Again, we'll start from the question number one. Is the skin is intact? So these are the sagittal T2 and T1 weighted images. Why I'm saying um, for the beginners, just the CSF is giving the hyper intense signals and CSF is low. So T1 and T2, so sagittal images. So coming to back to our question number one, is the skin is intact? Answer is yes, you can see, definitely here, you can see the skin is intact. Then uh, that's mean you're dealing with a closed defect and we know that. Now, instead of going to the question number two, we'll jump to the question number three, which is if it is the closed defect, either is there any subcutaneous mass? If yes, so is it a, so a CSF containing or the fat containing? So we know there's a subcutaneous uh, masses here with a closed defect. So there's a closed effect. There is a subcutaneous mass. The answer is yes, there's a subcutaneous mass. This is the diagram. So again, you can see there's a herniation, but it is an intact 
dystrophism, the skin is intact, but there's a large fatty uh, component. So it is the closed effect with a subcutaneous mass and this subcutaneous mass is predominantly having the fatty component. Yes, it has a CSF component, but you can see a large subcutaneous mass is covering it. When I see the subcutaneous mass, that's mean a large lipoma subcutaneous mass should be there with the skin. So yes, it is there. So now we have this case, forget about the diagnosis, what was the diagnosis in this case, coming to the another case to compare. Again, come to the, this is the different patient. Again, in this patient, two sagittal images, the T1 and the T2 weighted images. Question number one comes again. Is the skin is intact? You can see there's a skin. There's a skin, definitely it is the closed one. So answer is yes, the skin is intact. Then we, have, we know that it's a closed effect. So then the question again comes in cases of the closed effect. Is there any subcutaneous mass? And if the mass is there, is it a fat-containing mass or the CSF-containing mass? Then answer is, if you see, here it is a mass. So again, a closed effect covered with the skin, but it is this, um, uh, the fat-containing mass is there. You can see the mass here. This mass, we can see, you can just correlate it. So yes, there's a huge mass is there, a soft tissue fat-containing. So again, there's a closed effect. Yes, it has a subcutaneous mass. And actually, this mass is also containing uh, the fat containing. So here comes the million dollar question for you. Before you perform the surgery, you need to know. So we know when we have the closed effect, we have a subcutaneous mass, then the, the two entities come. The one is the lipomyloseal and another one is the lipomeningoseal. And in both cases, child will look like this. Then how can we answer this? This is a very important question. So answer this uh, important question, remember, so you need to remember one thing, the interface of the neural tissue, which is the black cord with that, this lipoma. If the interface of this lipoma, which is a subcutaneous lipoma with the neural tissue is outside the spinal canal, then you are dealing with a lipoma and seed. And why this comes out? Because of the herniation of the CSF space, meningeal, um, the cerebrinoid space. So uh, just, I'll try to make it clear. This is your vertebral body. Just look at the diagram. This is the vertebral body. So you see this area till here, it is the outer limit of your spinal canal. These are your lateral processes. This is the outer limit. So if the placard is coming out and having the interface with this fat outside the spinal canal, same thing. If this neural tissue is having the interface with this fatty tissue outside the spinal canal, then you are dealing with the lipomeningocele and you have this little bit expansion of the CSF space. Similarly, another entity, uh, lipomyloseal, again, if the lipoma, this subcutaneous lipoma, you can see here, and you can see here, and you can see here, having the neural tissue, neural tissue is having the interface with this fat within the spinal canal. This is the outer limit of spinal canal, or do you let me draw, this is the outer limit. So you can see, just forget about this area, this fat is going inside, and this is your neural placard. So the interface of neural placard with this lipoma, this lipoma is going inside, is inside the spinal canal. So that's when you are dealing with the lipomyloseal, not lipomyloseal. So again, another case, you can see the mass, subcutaneous mass. You can see the cord is coming, the neural tissue is coming out of it. And the interface that you see is within it, within the spinal canal. Here you can see, or I think more clearly in the T2 weighted image, you can see here, or you can see within the spinal canal. A subset you are able to see is in the T1. So TK, so this is your lipomyloseal. Another case, another mass, closed effect, but you can see there's a whole expansion, but this time just focus on this area. You can see this area, forget about this arrow, this area. So you can see, and if you draw a line from here and you draw a line from here, the neural tissue is coming out. Lipoma is this white thing, and it has the interface outside the boundary of the spinal canal. So that's mean you are dealing with the lipomeningocele. So do not forget the lipoma placard interface to differentiate between these two entities. Now uh, we have uh, uh, now we have discussed um, the closed effect with the subcutaneous mass and the masses which are fat containing. Now we are left with the closed uh, closed effect where you can again have the subcutaneous mass, but in those cases, this time, this mass is CSF containing. So the two, they, it has a, it's a big list of entities there, but for the sake of time, I'm just focused, I'm going to focus on the two, which is one is the terminal myelocystoseal, another one is the meningocele. 
So winning the seal is a simple thing. Again, you can see it's a closed effect. You can see there, yes, there is a skin which is covering it. There's an elevated mass. Yes, we know there's an elevation mass, but in cases of meningo seal, it is different. You can see this is the cord and there's no herniation of cord through the posterior element. It's just a CSF space is coming out. The meninges, the rectoid spaces are coming. Same thing, there's a defect in the skin, which is covered by the, um, by the a defect in the posterior element, which is covered by the skin. And you can see the herniation of the CSF space only, but the cord is intact at its place within the spinal cloud. So you have a simple cystic cavity having no soft tissue, no neural tissue. This is the meningocele. But the very important thing to differentiate is the myelocystocele because uh, I think Dr. Athar is a better person to uh, comment on that because I think the surgical management of the meningocele uh, from the myelocystocele is totally different. And why so? Let's see what is the difference uh, different between two entities. So you can see, again, you have a bump which is covered by the skin. So it has a subcutaneous mass, closed defect, but the, a purely cystic. But this cystic, if you compare from this cystic area is having a cyst within cyst appearance. You see, or you can see a complex cyst, or you can see a multiple cyst. So you can see there are one, two, and three cysts. They are the one, two, and three cysts. But remember this, this is whole thing is not the CSF space. It is, it is not the meningo seal only. So you, you, you can see these two stars. These are the dilated mango seal cells here you can see in the diagram here these are but this third space if you focus on this third space this third space is continue with this low lying cord and having the uh, dilated spinal canal you can see this dilated spinal canal if you just look at my um, the line which i'm drawing this is coming and now suddenly it's getting open within this uh, meningo seal so there's a there's a dilate, low line cord which is having the dilated canal, syringomyelia or hydromyelia, and this canal is opening into the meningo seal. So cyst within cyst, that means meningo seal is containing another cystic cavity. So what is the difference if you don't know this important information and you just think that probably you're dealing with a complex meningo seal or what you are going to do, you are going to end up in a disaster because this, as we all know, as a as doctor, this canal, the spinal canal is lined by the ependymal cells, and you are exposing it uh, with the, the external environment, and you are just infecting the whole ventricular and CSF uh, system. So this is this is very very important thing to differentiate uh, the, from the meningocele, and do not label it as a complex or infected or septated meningocele. It's not like that. If you have the septations, if you have it, you have to be very very much sure that you are not dealing with the myelocystocele. Remember again, if you have multiple cysts or cyst within cyst appearance, think of the myelocystocele and think of the your dilated canal before you are going to operate on these kids. So, so far I have shown just, I'm trying to summarize my closed spinal strafism with the subcutaneous mice. I've shown you the lipomyloseal and lipomelingoseal. Both are the closed effect with the bumps, fat containing, how to differentiate. Remember your cord lipoma junction outside or um, inside the spinal canal. Always remember that. And now again, I show you the closed type of the closed strafism with the subcutaneous mass. But this time, the fat is not fat containing, is a CSF. But again, the two important entities to differentiate the myelocystocele and the seal. Cyst within cyst, remember, it's a myelocystocele. And if it is simple cyst, that you're dealing with the seal. So, so far, um, before I move on, uh, I'm just stopping here. Do I have any question to answer? Or Dr. Atha, do you want to add anything in it? Or should I move on? Um, I believe I don't have uh, any um, questions, so I can move on, right? Yes, ma'am. So, yeah. So we have done with the open defect. We have discussed. We have discussed the um, closed defect with the subcutaneous masses, the fat-containing masses, and CSF-containing masses. Now we are left with a no cell closed defect, but having no uh, subcutaneous mass. That's mean yeah, either we are dealing with a simple low-lying cord, which may have the um, uh, um, phyllolipoma, dermal sinus, or the dastromethamylia. So um, coming uh, to the systemic approach, we have discussed the three questions. The question number one, we have discussed. Question number two, we have discussed. The subcutaneous mass, the closed dystrophism, we have discussed. Now we are moving towards the question number four, which is either we have the interspinal uh, fatty lesion or either do we have uh, interspinal 
cystic lesion or we have the subcutaneous fat and what is the position of the conus radius. So again, question number four, intraspinal fatty lesion is there or not? If it is the closed defect, it is not having skin stigma. Then if you see in this particular case, this is the T1 axial and sagittal images. You can see a hypertense area, this area, so anything right on T1 is a fat. We all know that. So it was, yes, that we have an intraspinal fatty lesion. Then most important question comes, then what is the relationship of this intraspinal fatty lesion with the cord? Very important. So you can see it is attached to the dura in the lower uh, cord, uh, number spine cord, uh, just above the conus medullary. So it was, it is the intradural lipoma that we are dealing with. Another case, different case, question comes again. It is a closed dystrophism. No, have not having any subcutaneous mass. Is there any intraspinal fatty lesion? Answer is yes. Again, we can see the bright signals in the lower part of the um, cord and on the fat set suppressed as the fat was suppressed in this T2 fat set sequence. So you can see it was a bright lipoma. It has suppressed now. So it, uh, it is the intraspinal fatty lesion. Again, the most important question come after you identify these fatty lesions. What is the relationship of this fatty lesion with the cord? So if you see, Unlike the previous case, it is not attached to the dura. It is attached with the phylum terminal. This is your phylum terminal. This is your conus medullary. So it is not a dura lipoma. It is a lipoma of the phylum terminal. Again, a third case, you can see another fat-containing intraspinal lesion here. It is an intradural phylipoma. But in this particular case, there is a very, another important information is there. You can see a dermal sinus defect. So I'll focus again and again, especially for the radiology resident who are with us. If in your imaging, you have this kind of defect, dystrophism, try to look at the periphery, uh, at the periphery of the images, you will find this dermal sinus. And it is a very, very important information, which you really uh, need to mention in your report. And why is it so? Let me show you this case. This was the case of a um, two months old baby boy who born with the sacral dimple and ultrasound postnatal period immediately done just to evaluate this, uh, this dimple. And it was reported simply as the low line cord. Child was not having any neurological symptoms and it was okay. We said, okay, go ahead. The, we found only a small lesion here. You can see this lesion is here. And this was a low line cord. An MRI was performed uh, after the ultrasound. It was confirmed there's a small cystic lesion, it took being a benign pairing lesion, probably an inclusion cyst or something, nothing to worry, low line cord, and that's it. But what happened? Uh, after the ninth month, this child had the follow up MRI. And at that time, why the MRI was done? It was done because this child was having the lower limb weakness. And this time, fat set T2 rated images were showing what? Significant, you can see the expansion of the spinal canal. Yet see and significant heterogeneous enhancement. So what's happening? What's happened? Is there this is modojo? The previously seen lesion has become aggressive neoplastic lesion of the cord. Did we miss any germ cell tumor or any aggressive lesion of the cord? So what was missing, which we missed if you go back, we missed in our initial MRI. If you focus at the periphery of the image, there was a dermal sinus. Can you see this dermal sinus? I hope uh, I'm very bad in drawing, and I'm please my apologies for that but I'm trying to make it simple. So you can see the dermal sinus here. So this is the dermal sinus, which was the pathway of the spread for the bacterial infection. Actually, this was not the lesion to worry about. It's just a simple benign appearing inclusion cyst. So this dermal sinus was the pathway for the spread of infection. And the whole thing, aggressive lesion that you are seeing right now is not a mass, it has abscess formation. So very, very, again, I'll emphasize, if you have a closed defect, no, you have nothing, but you have a sinus, then think about this track, try to value this track, try to mention that at least the surgeon know that there is a sinus and probably there's a need to close that sinus track uh, just to avoid the infection or infecting this whole cavity. Again, um, um, we, we, when we talk about the intraspinal uh, lesion, this particular case, again, the child was having the neurological system. Question number four comes again, do you have in this particular case any intraspinal lesion? So if you focus here, you, in like previous cases, you don't have any intraspinal lesion, but you can see some dilatation of the dual sac. But most important thing is the low-lying cord. You can see there's a stretching of the phylum terminal. So it was a tight phylum terminal, which is always, always, always associated with a long line, a low line conus matrix. So when we say that low line cord, so very, we really need to know when we care what, how much low is the low actually. So always remember, no matter what is the age of the baby, or what either you're dealing with a neonate or you're dealing with an adult, 
the normal position of the conus madre commonly generally is the uh, disc level l1 l2 level but always remember anything below the uh, disc level of l2 l3 is always abnormal no matter what the age is so when we can call it low lying think of the l2 l3 disc level always so so far for the closed defect with no subcutaneous mass i have shown you the three entities all are associated with the low lying cord one was the phylum terminal the phylum um, lipoma your dural lipoma and the phylum terminal uh, the the dural lipoma and the phylum lipoma and the third was the uh, any of these thing can be associated with your dermal sinus which is always at the periphery of the picture all this focus very important information which you are not supposed to miss so coming to the next uh, question number 5 if you don't have the fatty lesion the another question is do you have any infraspinal cystic lesion if you have a closed defect you don't have any subcutaneous mass the answer is in this particular yes yes you can see there is a cystic lesion is here and in the axillary images you can see the cystic lesion is here when you have a, any infraspinal cystic or the fatty lesion the question again the important question comes what is the location and what is the uh, relationship of this cystic lesion with the cord so you can see on ultrasound we have confirmed that cystic lesion was arising from the phylum terminal you can see so it is a simple phylar cells you can see the cord the phylum and at the, at the tip of the phylum you have the cells so this is not the part of the cord so don't forget it's just as incidental finding hum every 10 neonates ke jo ultrasound karte hain we find this incidental finding in one of those kid so it has no clinical significance it goes with the time but focus on this case it is again the case in respinal cystic lesion again answer is yes we do have this t2 hypertense cystic lesion yes we have in respinal cystic lesion the again the important question come what is the location so see unlike the previous case this time the final terminal is here you can see the phylum terminal is here it is above that so it is the part of the conus medullary the cyst is present in the conus medullary so this is the terminal ventricle cyst and why this happen it uh, it happens when there is incomplete or defective fusion of the primary neuralgia primary tube with the secondary tube occurs you have this persistent terminal phy uh, phylum and you need to remember as a surgeon as a as a radiologist that it is lined by the ependymal layer sometime it gets stretch or sorry expanded and because of the expansion it may give the neurological symptoms paralysis and the 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 the, the, the patient may need a surgery to decompress the cystic lesion coming to the another case again the question comes is there any infraspinal lesion again answer is yes but unlike the two cases this time you focus on the lesion location this is this is your cord and this is present anteriorly here so it is not the part of the cord it is not part of the conus medullaris it is not the part of the phylum terminal this is present anterior to the spinal cord and this time you are dealing with the neuroenteric cyst so whatever you have a infraspinal cystic lesion the location of the lesion says you to what i am if it is anterior then you think of the neuroenteric phylar cyst with the phylum terminal or conus medullaris then you think of the um of uh, uh, terminalis uh, uh, ventricular terminalis so now we have discussed everything um uh, we have discussed the closed defect with no subcutaneous mass now coming to the dastromatomyelia and this my me to the doctor omehania who tweeted uh, on the twitter who, who she said that she found dastromatomyelia very interesting to omehania this slide goes for you so coming to the dastromatomyelia dastromatomyelia it name name suggests it has um, it is the uh, splitting of the two cords and when this abnormality occur it occurs at the time of dastrolation then instead of one notochord there the two notochord form and the formation of the two cord notochord lead to the two separate cord formation but what i remember all of you to remember that never ever never ever rely on your sagittal images whenever you see try to diagnose this condition on your sagittal images or the coronal images you will end up calling it as a infraspinal cyst whenever you have a cord expansion in the sagittal images or cystic images always confirm on your axillary images for example in the, the sagittal images can be very disturbing when we review this on the axillary image you always find two different two separate cords you can see the two separate cords instead of one they are separated with this black line this black line is the bony spur which is separating this so you can see the diaphragm a bony spur coming from the vertebral body is separating the two cords and both cords are having their own csf space the anterior and posterior nerves um there was a type 
one dastromaliomyelia. Now coming to the type two dastromaliomyelia, again, again, I emphasize, do not rely on the sagittal or corneal images. Always confirm this expansion on the axial image. You have the uh, two cords again, but unlike the previous dastromaliomyelia type one, you don't have any bony spur. You don't have any bony spur, which is separating it. So if you have the two cords, which are sharing <laughs> the same equal set, but we don't have any bony spur separating in it. So for the dastromaliomyelia, whenever the people who lives in Karachi and who remember the old, uh, this train system or the people who are from the cities where the train system works very well, they, they can correlate the dastromaliomyelia easily with this uh, train track. Uh, my, uh, my teacher um, taught me that whenever you have a stin stigma, such as a spin bird mark, or you, if you have a hair, tough of hair, so always remember, you need to go and see and look for the dastromaliomyelia. So always remember, if you have a no mass, you have a skin stigma, especially like a tough of hair, you are dealing with the dastromaliomyelia. Even you can diagnose it without performing your image. Yes, I'm going to deal with this particular entity and I need to look in my image in images for this specific entity. So dastromaliomyelia type one, just to make easy for you, uh, type one, you have the duplicated dual sac, which are separated from the bony spur. So that's mean you have the two separate tracks of the train, which are separated by the, uh, the, the bone, you can see, and they both have their own boundaries or their thecal sac. Coming to the type two, they are the train type, which merge with each other. They are sharing their thickle sex. Sometimes they get um, joined and sometimes they get separated. So with these uh, train tracks, you can always remember the type one and the type two dastromatomalia, which is again, very, very important information. As a surgeon, you need to know, as a uh, radiologist, you need to provide because when they go inside to remove the teasering of the cord, they need to cut or they need to remove this um, separating um, the spur, the bony spur as well. So what is the take home message for overall? I just want you to again emphasize, keep this chart. Um, um, let me just uh, keep this chart, the clinical radiological classification chart and your reporting area while you're dealing with a dystrophism. Keep this clinical radiological classification chart in your clinics whenever you're having a baby. Paste it in somewhere in your clinics and whenever the child come or the pre-vision come to you, go back, review this chart and come back to your patient so that you are the, so that, you, that, will, that will really help you to diagnose uh, the spinal dysrhythm properly. So if you have an open defect, having an elevated mass, you are dealing with the myelomeningocele. If you have an open defect, no elevated mass, you are dealing with the myelocele. If you have a closed defect, having a subcutaneous mass like this, either you are dealing with the fat-containing uh, um, uh, entities such as lipomyelocele or lipomeningocele, or if you have a closed defect with subcutaneous mass, or it is only having a CSF containing one, but either you are dealing with a terminal myelocystocele and meningocele. Or if you have gross defect but no subcutaneous mass and you have any of these skin stigmata, then you are either dealing with a phylar lipoma, dermal sinus, phylum terminal, or dastromatomyelia. And in certain cases, you have that recorded regression syndrome. I'm not going to deal with the cordial regression syndrome because of the interest of time. But again, the cordial regression syndrome is another entity which you need to uh, keep in mind. So again, the systemic approach, again, I will emphasize whenever you're reporting these MRI cases for the radiology resident, keep the systemic approach six question in your reporting area while you're reporting. And for the neurosurgeon resident, keep the systemic approach questions, paste it somewhere in your clinic whenever you're dealing with uh, the spinal uh, distractism. This will really help you uh, to diagnose and to differentiate different entities, which looks like a um, um, as I showed my earlier slide, like a nest doll, you really can't differentiate between them until unless you answer these questions clearly. So with this, um, I do have any question before I move on towards the quiz. Let me see what is this. Hania, this was thank you, Hania. So um, I don't think, so what is the, uh, what is the age of this patient? I don't know, Rabit, which patient you are talking, but jitne bhi bachche maine dikhaye hain, they all, these all were the young children, sare new nates hi the. Jinki cases America except the uh, the few. So okay, Mustafa, I know we have 15 minutes left, and uh, I, I, I'll be right now. If you have any question, um, please ask the question. I can take the question, but agar uh, Mustafa ne mujhe ultimatum de diya, we have learned the quiz. Okay, perfectly. So only three out of you have. Uh, okay. Okay. Oh God. To differentiate between these. Please don't disappoint me, guys. <laughs> Correct answer it. Don't do this to me. Otherwise, I'm going to disappoint you. 
So, so far, 100% of you have answered. So let's end the poll and the share the results. So um, majority of you are thinking this is the lipomyelocell and I'm glad, but I'm not happy because 33% of you are thinking it is the lipomyelomangocell. So, but I'm glad the majority of you uh, got it right. Um, uh, but, uh, so, but that this is the results. These are the results. Yeah, yeah, I'm going back. Yeah, yeah, I'm going back. I'm going back. So this is the results. And I'm stopped sharing the results. And now I'm moving towards the slides. So remember what I said, look and focus for the interface. So if you focus on the interface, so this was the correct answer. So lipoma was going inside. This is the lipoma. And I think that's on. Uh, okay. So you can see the lipoma is going inside the spinal canal. This is the outer margin and the interface of lipoma with the placard and neural tissue is inside. So of course, you are dealing with the lipomyloseal, not lipomeningoseal. Just a quick re uh, re review of the slide which I've taught you. Cl close spinal dystrophism with uh, subcutaneous. If the interface is, always remember, within the spinal canal, it is the lipomyloseal. And if it is outside the canal, it is the lipomeningoseal. And remember again, if there's a cyst within cyst appearance, we are not dealing with a simple meningocele. It is the myelocystocele. You have to be very careful before your surgery. Or if it's just a simple cyst that you are dealing with the meningocele. So this was the answer. This is the repetition. Coming to the quiz number two. What is the diagnosis? What do you think? This is These are the two axial T2-weighted image. And this is the caudal T2-weighted image. Do you think it's a dastromatomyelia type 1? It's a caudal regression syndrome. Or you're thinking it's a dastromatomyelia type 2, or do you think it's a tight phylum terminal? And here comes your. How do you, how do you get rid quiz. of uh, the first one? Oh, it was a myelo. Uh, okay. Oh, drain so, tracks, drain tracks. So, doctor, uh, <laughs> don't give the hint, let them. Hania will be very happy because this goes for her. Again. <laughs> but again, the trick is that what's the diff? Again, if you are on the right track, all of you, okay, so all of you 100% have voted. Let me end the poll, share the results. So, majority of you got it right again. It's a, I'm very glad to see the results. At least I'm not disappointed. That it was a type dastomatomalia type one. Why the portal regression and why not a type, type two? I'm just stop sharing. Now, let's go back and see our images. So, it was a dastomatomyelia uh, type 2. If focus on the scan, there are the two cords. Of course, there's a dastomatomyelia, but which type? You remember your bone. There's a big bone is coming from the vertebral body here. You can see it here. And this is the bone. It's a very, very important information if you attend the neurological uh, the, uh, neurosciences meeting. All the time, whenever they have this question, they will ask you, is there any spur? Is there anything which we need to go and take it out? Yes, it is important information to know. Again, as Dr. Atheranam said, don't forget your train tracks. If it is the type 1, you will have the two separate tracks with the two thickle sac and separating bone in it. And if you have a type 2, then you have the one dual sac um, sharing the same, uh, two cords are sharing the same track and you don't have any intervening spinal um, uh, spur or the cartilaginous or bony spur in it. So that's the recall of the train track. Again, coming to the question number 3. All spinal dystrophism are associated, open one, are associated with which brain malformation? And here comes your poll for that. And I'm launching the poll. Okay, now vote. You think they are associated with a type 1, type 2, Dendy Walker syndrome, or Ponto cerebral hypoplasia? Uh, Karan, can I ask you a quick question? So, can, yeah, yeah. can you, an MRI, can you distinguish between diplomyelia and hemicord or not really? Some. For these two, it is very challenging. Most of the time, I fail to do that. You have to do surgery. Mein hi karna pata. Yes, sometimes it is very challenging and you can't, because the same sac they are sharing, very difficult to do that. Okay. And imaging is not high quality, you can gray matter, white matter. Ko... Uh, between... heavily T2 weighted images are he has the cysts, if you perform the cysts, then probably you are able to answer it. But that is something which I, as a radiologist, struggle a lot. Probably and I'm you know, not a neuroradiologist, but right. sometimes they do. They do struggle a lot and you get the answer after the surgery. Okay, great. So, or 
Okay, so yeah. this is the, I'm sharing the result for this Q, uh, quiz. I'm glad that 80%, 83% of you are right. It is the, you you were up. You were koi sroze mein so nahi raha tha. And I emphasize this again, whenever you have an open dystrophism, it is always, always um, um, associated with... <laughs> Don't do that in the chat box. We have only one question. So just a quick recall for the open defect. As I, I mentioned earlier in my, the, again, the same slide, Agya, do not forget, Whenever you have an open defect, no matter some myeloseal or myelomeningoseal, focus at the cranial cervical junction, uh, or you will have some kind of brain herniation. This is a very important piece of information you definitely don't want to mess with or don't want to miss. Okay? So it's a carry type for two. Not one, one ekalag entity. Hai. It is not the spectrum. Most of the things uh, people think that carry malformation is a spectra. These are not the spectra. Type 1, type 2, and type 3 are the different entities having nothing to do with each other. I think that's a that's a very important point. You know, a lot of yeah. times people think that oh, yeah, it's a one, two. Three. Yeah, people, people, people. Most of the time think that the carry malformation is a spectra, and one is the mild side of the spectrum, and the other one is the the severe form. No, it's not. These are the different three entities. I don't know why they are labeled type one and type two. Different uh, imaging finding, uh, different um, uh, management. So they are not the spectra. They are the different entities. Okay. So coming to our question, yeah, this is a very, very um, easy um, answer. I think my residents have problem, uh, radiology residents thoda soche, but surgical residents, ke liye, it should not be a problem. So what do you think? Uh, let me, um, uh, which entity is the neuro, uh, neurosurgical emergency where you really don't want to wait for any uh, imaging and you will go for that? I'm launching the poll. This is the last question. Now let's see. And I, I, I'm believing that I'll get the 100% answer. Oh, no way. People are... Oh, I thought I'll get the 100% answer for that. I said, which entity is the neurosurgical emergency? I asked a question at the end. I think it's a chakra. No, I don't want to chakra. If people are sitting there, they should know. No, I'm giving my hand. Neurosurgical emergency is what do you think? What could this can be? Oh my God. It means that you have to operate it For neurosurgical emergency means you will even not operate sometimes. So if you have not get imaging, you will say, no, I cannot wait and I'm going to open this, uh, close this patient. So what this can be? And there's only a one thing which is uh, giving the hand for the, only the one option. You can't take it back. Yes, they can. Ab, still, Till that, abhi ab sab apne answer change kar sakte. Aap inko hint de de. Phir bhi agar hi pick karne to baat hai. I mean, aap kar lenge. You are allowed to give them the hint. Yeah, risk ye infection na ho jaye na. Ha, to ab soche. Bilkul. That was the hint. Aisi kaun si cheez hai jo infection cause kar dega? Which is phat jaye, mano ba infection ho gaya to. You are such a good examiner. I wish ki aap mere examiner har dafa bani ho. Itne hints mujhe mile, to mera to exam hi clear ho jaye. Yeah, yeah, you people can change it. Still, you have the time. If the ah, time, ah, there are people are changing. No, doctor, the people are changing. <laughs> you, you played the trick. So now uh, I'm uh, ending this poll. When uh, Mustafa Kenge, I'm so 10 minutes drag. Hai. So, uh, okay, let me share the results. So, um, Unfortunately, most of you got it wrong. It was not the phylum, tight phylum terminal. It was the myelomeningo seal. And Dr. Azhar was um, uh, giving you the, let, let me share the results first. So this is what we, most of the people are thinking of the tight. I hope my results are on the screen, are thinking of the tight phylum terminal. But um, let me stop sharing this. Yeah. yeah. So this was the correct answer. The myelomeningo seal was the answer. Uh, agar, if you remember, lipo, um, the lipomyelo seal, lipomeningo seal, these all are the closed defect. Lipo word is still telling you that there's a lipoma which is covering. So, they, so the spinal cord, the CSF content, the cord is not exposed to the external world, exterior, external mm -hmm. environment, sorry. And again, the talum, tight talum, uh, uh, phylum terminal, although it is associated with many things, but sometimes when it is alone, it is closed dystrophism. It is covered by the strain, covered by the subcutaneous tissue. The only thing which is a, where there's no coverage is there, which is the type of the open defect is the myelomeningo seal. When the placard, the neural tissue is um, exposed to the external environment. And these are the cases to avoid the infection, to avoid any rupture of the cells, you definitely immediately want to operate upon these children. So answer was the myelomeningo seal. 
सो दैट्स ये था हमारा क्वेज एंड विद दैट थैंक यू सो मच एवरीबडी फॉर हैविंग मी ऑन दिस वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग प्लेट एजुकेशनल प्लेटफॉर्म आई रियली इंजॉयड इट इफ यू हैव एनी क्वेश्चन माई ई मेल एड्रेस इज रिटर्न हेयर एंड विद आई एम एंडिंग माई टॉक विद दिस डिस्कलोजर दैट आई एम स्टिल अर्निंग and yes we all are still learning till right